The alarm clock rang at the usual time, 6 a.m., and my wife Anita and I got up to start our day. I groaned loudly as I sat on the edge of the bed and lowered my feet to the floor. What's the matter? You're grunting like an old man, she teased as she headed for the bathroom. I feel like an old man after what you did to me last night. I heard her laughing in the bathroom, remembering the night before. She'd fucked me vigorously. Today she was leaving on a business trip and would probably be gone all week and I would be home alone. I wasn't looking forward to it. I heard the shower running and thought about joining her, but then I decided I didn't want to. She had taken too much out of me for the evening. When I returned to the bedroom later, she looked awake while I sat there feeling sorry for myself. Come on, man, get up and go. We need two breadwinners to pay the mortgage on this place. Okay, okay, I'm moving, I told her, making my way to the bathroom to relieve myself and take a shower. Later, we met downstairs for breakfast before she headed to the airport and I headed to work. Anita is an attorney and we both worked at a mid-sized manufacturing company in St. Louis. She specializes in negotiations and travels with teams when they are working outside the plant, and this trip involved negotiating a new subcontract with a large aerospace firm in Denver. She traveled for such negotiations several times a year and each time was gone for at least a week. She was 35 years old, and 12 years before that, she had graduated with honors from the State University. Anita is very attractive, 163 centimeters, 57 pounds, with lovely feminine facial features, 86X61X89, and I am madly in love and lusting after her. I am Jack Fillmore, and I work as an engineer for the same company as my wife. I am 37 years old. My height is 185 centimeters with a weight of 75 kilograms. I exercise to stay in shape. We both love to play golf and often make a foursome with friends. We met at a company picnic, and for me, it was love at first sight. The same must have been true for her, because after a whirlwind courtship, we were married six months later. We have been married for seven years now, and just three months ago, we bought the house we live in now. It was the house where we planned to start our family, and Anita would stop taking birth control pills when she returned from this trip. We were excited about starting a family, and she planned to be a stay-at-home mom until the kids went to school. Our parents lived in the neighborhood, and I know they expected us to start a family soon. After breakfast, I loaded Anita's travel bag into her car and kissed her goodbye. She had tears in her eyes as she got into the car to drive away. Very soon, hopefully I won't be traveling, sunshine, then I won't have to say goodbye. I hate them. I hate them just as much as you do, sweetheart, I reassured her. I'll see you Friday night, and we'll just get takeout so you can relax. Three, we'll be good. Bye. I watched her drive out of the garage and onto the street. Waving to her as she drove away, I then went inside to finish getting ready to leave for the office. Arriving at work, I went up to the engineering department and grabbed a cup of coffee in the break room before heading to my desk. I had barely had a chance to sit down when the phone rang. Fillmore, I announced to whoever was calling. Jack, could you come into my office for a minute? Sure, Evan. I'll be right there. Evan was my boss, so I grabbed my coffee and headed into his office. Once in his office, he waved for me to sit in the chair. Jack, I think you're gonna like this. I remember last Friday you told me that Anita would be traveling this week, so I have a little trip for you if you're interested. Gil Hawkins, our service engineer in California, is sick and can't deal with a problem a customer in San Jose is having with one of our models. You have more experience with this model than anyone else, so would you like to go to San Jose and check it out? Uh. There's not much going on here right now, and you're right, I'm a little hung up this week, so when do you want me there? Right now, have Katie get you reservations and tickets and you call the client and let him know you're coming and find out what the problem is. That sounds good. I'm on it. I was starting to feel a little more enthusiastic about life. I can go home, pack up and fly out of here this afternoon and be at the client's in the morning. Okay, have a safe trip. I stopped at Evan's secretary's desk, Kathy, and told her what I needed in terms of flights and reservations, and then went to my desk to call the client and determine their problem before I went home to pack. On the way home, I chuckled to myself because I had a plan forming in my head that if I finished quickly, I could surprise my wife with a stop in Denver on the way home. The prospect of spending a couple days with her in Denver was getting more exciting by the minute. While waiting for my flight at the airport, I called Anita's cell phone, but she didn't pick up. 
so I left a voice message that I would stay with relatives for a couple of days and that she would call me on my cell phone in the evenings. Everything went fine. I was at the customer's house on Tuesday morning, made the necessary adjustments to the equipment, and by noon, everything was tested and working satisfactorily. Back at the hotel, I called the airline and boarded a flight that would take me to Denver at 9 p.m. local time. After checking out of the hotel in San Sochi, I headed to the San Francisco airport where I had dinner. While I was eating, Anita called me on my cell phone and we talked for a few minutes. She asked how my family was doing and I answered as if I were at home. She told me that the negotiations were progressing but that she was tired and would spend a quiet evening in her hotel room. We said goodbye with an expression of love and after a meal I boarded my flight. At 9.45 I checked in at the hotel desk in Anita's suite and after verifying my identity, I was given a card to enter her room. As I quietly entered the room, I saw that the lamp above the computer desk was lit and her laptop was on it, closed, but Anita was nowhere to be seen. I put my suitcase down and peeked into the bedroom, but it was empty, as was the bathroom. Hi, well, I thought, she hasn't gone back to her room yet, I'll sit and wait or maybe go downstairs and see if she's there. Then I noticed the door to the next room was ajar. I walked over to it and it opened quietly on well-oiled hinges. I looked around the living room in the adjoining room but saw no one. Puzzled, I stepped into the room and suddenly heard a groan from the bedroom. My gut clenched and I was suddenly covered in sweat as I quietly approached the bedroom door. My heart may not have stopped, but my breathing quickened at what I saw there in the dimly lit room. Anita was sitting on the bed, naked, facing me riding a man whose face I couldn't see. Her eyes were closed and she was gently riding him in an obvious ecstasy of bliss and his hands were caressing her breasts. My first impulse was to rush to her and beat the guy to a pulp, but reason overrode emotion and I slowly backed away from the door and returned to her room. Opening my travel bag, I pulled out the digital camera I'd brought with me to take some souvenir shots and walked back to the other bedroom door. I turned off the flash and set the camera to low light, then stood quietly and took a few shots of the scene on the bed without attracting the attention of either of them. They were so engrossed in what they were doing that they had their eyes closed and were completely oblivious to their surroundings. Before returning to the room, I checked the open briefcase on the desk, found a business card and checked the name. Sam Harris, our company's chief negotiator. I put the card in my pocket. Back in her room, I pulled out the camera computer interface cable I'd been carrying and connected the camera to her laptop. Our laptops had the same photo program, so it wasn't difficult to download a picture from my camera and install it on her desktop. Then I packed the camera in my travel bag and quietly left her room. Before I left, I heard her scream as she experienced the finish line. I almost cried right there, but continued on to the elevator. After returning my registration card to the counter, I called the airline to find out when the next flight to St. Louis was leaving. As luck would have it, there was a 6.30 a.m. flight that would get me home at 9.30 a.m. If I was lucky, I figured that would be about the time Anita would open her laptop at the conference table. That's when she'd know she'd been caught, and it would also let her know that our marriage was over. Back at the airport, I checked into a nearby motel where I couldn't sleep but kept imagining what I saw in her hotel bedroom. I cried and let my distress come out in tears. When I left the motel at five o'clock in the morning, I was covered in tears, and my mind was on consummating our marriage as soon as possible. Arriving back in St. Louis, my cell phone started ringing as I was getting into my car, and upon checking the number, I saw it was Anita. I turned it off and headed home. When I entered the house, the house phone was still ringing, but upon checking the caller ID, I saw that it was Anita again. Turning the receiver to the answering machine, I heard her crying into the receiver. Jack, please call me right now. I need to talk to you, honey. It's important. I ignored her pitiful sobs, got up and changed my clothes, then went and rented a truck, then went back inside to start packing. If my calculations were correct, she should be arriving around 4 p.m., and I wanted to be out of the house by then. It took a couple hours, but I managed to get all of my personal belongings out and move them into a rented storage unit. Before packing up, I called our attorney and made an appointment with him for the afternoon. After unloading my belongings at the warehouse, 
I went to my appointment with our attorney and asked him to begin divorce proceedings immediately. I was tempted to cite adultery as the reason for the divorce, but I decided to cite incompatibility and save the adultery in case she wanted to fight the divorce. I also asked him to make a new will naming my brother as a beneficiary. After stopping by the bank, I transferred half of our savings and new account balances into my name only, and then called my investment advisor to do the same with our accounts with him. With a sad heart, I drove to my parents' house and, taking my suitcase with me, walked up and in through the open door. My mother saw me first and exclaimed loudly, Jack, where have you been? Anita called here several times looking for you. Did you tell her you were staying here? My father, who had already retired, came in and I sat down at the table and explained everything to them. They were shocked when I told them about Anita's infidelity and that our marriage was over. I asked if I could stay with them for a few days until I could find a furnished apartment, and they agreed. I guess my calculations were pretty accurate, because around six in the evening, as we were sitting down to dinner, the doorbell rang. My father got up to answer it and returned a minute later with Anita behind him looking very upset. Jack, why didn't you answer my calls? I needed to talk to you. You moved all your stuff out of the house. I think the message I left you on your desk will tell you everything you need to know. Oh my God, I was so afraid it was you. Can we go somewhere and talk, honey, please? Anita, I'm not your sweetheart anymore, and I have nothing to talk to you about. I've already started divorce proceedings, and our attorneys can relay anything you need to know. What I saw in Denver has completely destroyed any feelings I had for you, and I want you to leave so I can finish my dinner. Oh, please, Jack, no. Please don't do this without talking to me. What can you say that would atone for your infidelity? What I saw and what I have pictures of was definitely not rape. Better call your lover Sam and tell him I'm going after him tomorrow. Maybe his wife will have a better perspective than I do. Oh my God, can't we talk? Please, Jack, please go away, Anita. My dinner's getting cold. I'll tell you what. Why don't you write me a long letter telling me how you can justify breaking your wedding vows? I'm sure a smart lawyer like you can articulate what my fault was and that you can still love and respect me. With a sob, she turned away. But before she reached the door, she turned around. Please, Jack, don't end our marriage without talking to me. Goodbye, Anita. After she left, my parents were still crying and sitting stunned. It was terribly cruel, Jack. Mom, do you want to see pictures of me with her and her lover? That's what's cruel. She has absolutely no respect for me, and I can't live with that, and I can never trust her again. You want me to give you grandchildren from a woman like that? I know, son, my father finally said. Maybe if things cooled down a little, you might see things differently. I knew my folks really liked Anita. I don't think so, Dad. Let's talk about something else so I can digest my food. Okay, son. Anita. As I left the house Monday morning, I was sorry I had to leave Jack behind, but I thought how wonderful it would be when I got back and we could start our family. We'd waited so long to make sure that financially and career-wise we were ready to be parents. Now, everything was almost ready. The trip to Denver went without incident. I sat next to Sam Harris, our chief negotiator, and we talked a little about tomorrow's negotiations and then a little about what was going on in our families. He knew that when I got pregnant, I would be leaving my job, and he said he would miss me. Sam was 48 years old, had been married for 20 years, and had two school-age children. Sam and I had been a negotiating team since before I was married, and we were very comfortable with each other. The other two members of our team sat behind us and had their own conversations. When we got to the hotel in Denver, we checked into our rooms, and as we usually did, Sam and I got adjoining rooms. This was originally to facilitate evening meetings for stratagem talks, but about ten years ago, sex was introduced, and we convinced ourselves that it was a way to relieve stress after a hard day of talks. At the time, we told ourselves that it really wasn't cheating on our wives if it helped us in our work. Sometimes we laughed about it. Then, after Jack and I had been married for a couple years, I got uncomfortable and we stopped doing it. Finally, during a particularly exhausting negotiation, Sam asked if we could do it again to relieve stress and anxiety. I reluctantly agreed, and before I knew it, I was engrossed in this activity with him again. The thrill of cheating and not getting caught had greatly increased my libido at home, so Jack benefited from it too, 
and I didn't feel so bad anymore. The first night of this trip, we didn't meet up because I was feeling tired after dinner. However, after our first day of talks, I agreed to go to his place the next night. I don't know when or how Jack found out about it or how he got the picture, but when I opened my laptop the next morning and turned it on, I was stunned by what I saw on the screen. Sam was sitting next to me, and when he saw it, he quickly slammed the lid shut and asked his coworker on the other side of the table to excuse us for a few minutes. We took the laptop out into the hallway. He was furious. What kind of movie is on your desk? He asked. I don't know, Sam. The last time I turned it on, it wasn't there. I was still in shock. Let me look at it again. Opening it up again, we looked at the picture together. Oh, shit, it's you, he exclaimed. Me? How can it be me? I don't know, but it's you. And underneath, it's probably me, though you can't see my face. Did you leave your laptop unattended last night? No, it was with me on the trip and in my room while I was in yours. Could someone have gotten into your room with a camera? I don't think so. The door was closed and I assume locked. You need to go back to the hotel and try to find out if someone gave you a card to your room last night. I'll handle things here. See if you can contact Jack and find out where he was last night. It couldn't have been him. I spoke to him last night at his in-laws. Did you call him on his in-laws phone? No, he asked me to call his cell phone. Oh, oh, I don't like the sound of that. He could have been anywhere when you talked to him. Call my cell phone if you hear anything. Do whatever you can to make it go away. Take a cab to the hotel. Okay, bye. I broke out in a sweat. If Jack took a picture and put it on my laptop, I have to assume it's a message that our marriage is over. I had to go back to the hotel and find out what I could find out. The girl at the front desk called me a cab, and 15 minutes later I was back at the hotel and first checked at the desk to see if anyone had gotten a card for my room. The clerk checked the computer and I was told that Mr. Jack Fillmore had received the card at 9.45 the previous evening. The card was returned a half hour later. That's when I realized that my marriage was probably over. The man I loved more than anything in the world was gone, but I had to try to fight to get him back. Once I got up to my room, I immediately tried to call his cell phone and work. His cell phone wasn't answering, it was turned off. But I left a voice message that it was important for him to call me as soon as possible. His secretary at work informed me that he was away on company business in California and should be back tomorrow. That's all. He left for California and stopped on the way back to surprise me. I think we were both surprised. After calling his folks, they said they hadn't seen him in a few days. I asked them to have him call me as soon as they could reach him. After calling home, I didn't get an answer, but I left a message there as well. I sat in my room and cried. I had no way to talk to him unless I went home. So I picked up the phone and booked my tickets to get back to St. Louis on the next flight. After packing, I called Sam on his cell phone and told him what I had found out. He was quiet for a minute before he spoke. Anita, I think we're both facing divorce or worse. What could be worse than a divorce? The company we work for has a policy that prohibits executive level employees from having close relationships. We could both be fired. It would look bad on our paperwork. Oh, God, I should have known this. But as far as I'm concerned, losing Jack would be much worse. Losing my family would be bad, too, but you need to go back to St. Louis and find Jack. Maybe he'll listen to reason. I've already booked a flight that leaves at noon. I need to be back there by 4.30. For my own good, I need to find him and talk to him. I'll let you know how it goes. I'll have to stay here until the negotiations are over. I'll be waiting for your call. We said goodbye and disconnected our phones. Grabbing my bag and laptop, I hurried to the lobby, checked out of the hotel, and took a limo to the airport. All the way to St. Louis, I prayed that Jack would talk to me. I had to explain that it was just sex and it didn't affect him in any way. I had to put everything on the line so that he would be unemotional about my infidelity and accept it for what it was. Nothing but meaningless sex. When I got home, I didn't notice anything unusual at first. But when I walked into our bedroom, I saw that all of his clothes and personal items were gone. I realized that he knew everything and had left me. I needed to find him. After many fruitless phone calls, I finally decided to go to his in-laws to see if he was there or if they had an idea where he was. He was at his in-laws and his reception made me sick with insensitive cruelty. He informed me that he was in the process of filing for divorce and did not want to talk to me, that there was nothing I could say that would change his mind. 
After he sarcastically told me to write him a long letter explaining my position, I left, got in my car, and cried. The family we had planned would never happen. We will never grow old together and enjoy grandchildren together. Selfishly, what made me even more sad was the thought that by the time I found another husband, I would be too old to conceive a child. Finally, I started the car and drove back to our empty house. Jack. After an insomnia during which I kept having visions of Anita and Sam together in bed, I got up early, walked down the stairs at my parents' house, and put on coffee. I then grabbed my laptop and camera and started downloading the pictures from the camera to my computer. I thought I should see if I could somehow recognize Sam in the pictures. Looking at the pictures, I couldn't make out Sam's face clearly, but then I noticed something on his right hand that was reaching for Anita's chest. Zooming in on the spot, I saw what I needed to see, a tattoo, and zooming in even more, I could see that it was a heart with the word Marie on it. Sam's wife's name was Marie. That was all I needed, so I went back upstairs, showered, and got ready for work. When I came downstairs, my mom was already up and making breakfast. Later, at work, I burned some CDs with the pictures I had taken and Sam's tattoo. I also printed out some kits and put them all in a folder. Then I went into our HR department and asked to meet with the manager. After all, Phil and I knew each other. It wasn't that big a company, and we played golf together. I pulled a set of photos out of the folder and laid them out in front of him. What are these, Jack? Pornographic pictures? He smirked. Sorry, Phil. They may look pornographic, but these are my wife and Sam Harris, and you can tell by the date and time on them that they were taken Tuesday night and in Sam's hotel room in Denver. They were there in negotiations for the company. Oh, shit, Jack. I'm sorry. What can I do? You can fire them both for cause under the misconduct clause in their contract with the company. We've never used that before. Are you sure you want to do that? It'll bring the affair to light. I assume that means you're going to divorce Anita over this? I've already had my lawyer draw up the papers, but if you don't, I'll sue the company. Okay, Jack. I'll get this to our legal department and start taking action. I then went in to see my boss, Evan, to tell him what was going on in my life. He was appropriately horrified that I had told him about my wife and Sam Harris. When I asked for the rest of the week as a vacation, he readily agreed. In parting, he congratulated me on a job well done on my trip to California. The customer called and complimented me on how quickly I solved their problem and got their production line working again. He also asked if I would consider taking the California job since the current field engineer was retiring for health reasons. I told him I would think about it and give him an answer when I returned to work next week. As I was leaving Evan's office, I was stopped by his secretary, Kathy. Jack, your wife was here looking for you. She said she'd be back later. Kathy, under no circumstances do I want to see my wife. Please let her know that when she gets back. Oh God, Jack, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize there was a problem. There's a big problem, Kat. We're getting a divorce. She and Sam Harris were doing the horizontal tango. I knew the factory would know about it by noon. Katie liked to spread gossip. Then I went back to my desk and called Marie Harris, Sam's wife. I knew her from company picnics and realized that my revelations about our spouses could be very hard on her. Uh, Marie, this is Jack Fillmore. What's up, Jack? I spoke to Sam last night, and he asked if I'd heard from you, but he didn't say what you might have contacted me about. Marie, we need to talk as soon as possible. Okay, Jack. Can you come over now? I have a hair appointment at one o'clock this afternoon, but I'm free right now. Do you still live on Fremont Street? Uh, yeah. Well, I know where you are right now. I'll be there in 15 minutes. When I arrived at the Harris's, I was horrified at what I was about to do to this woman and her family, but I knew Sam shouldn't avoid retribution for this and let Anita make her own decision. Hey, Jack, come on in. You want some coffee? I just brewed a fresh one, she asked, inviting me into the living room. That would be lovely, Marie. Just black, please. She returned a moment later with the coffee and sat down in the chair across from me. So, what's this conversation about? I thought about breaking my news to her gently, but then decided to get it over with as quickly as possible. Marie, I caught your husband and my wife making love in Denver, and I am pursuing a divorce from Anita and getting them both fired from their jobs. I hate to tell you this, but it's about to become public knowledge, so I thought I'd prepare you. I have pictures to prove what I'm telling you if you want to see them. 
I watched her face to determine the impact of my words and was surprised at the lack of any real reaction. Jack, I guess I suspected he'd been amusing himself on his business trips over the years, but I hoped it wasn't true. Sam had always been a loving husband and father, and I didn't want to rock the boat, but I realized that someday something would happen and their affair would become public. I think this is it. I sympathize with you and your marriage, and from my own perspective, I'm sorry that Sam might get fired. He's been around for years, and it may be hard for him to find another job that pays as well. Now I have to decide what I'm going to do. Do you want a set of the pictures I have? Yes, leave them, and I'll try to find the strength to look at them. I'm sorry, Marie, but I just couldn't leave it. Anita and I were going to start our family, but I can't live with a man I don't trust or respect. The mother of our children has to have both. I understand, Jack. Thank you for telling me I wouldn't want to hear it from another source first. And let me tell you again how sorry I am for you and Anita. I'm sure she's just as devastated and remorseful as Sam is when she finds out I know all about his cheating. If it was just a one-time thing, it would be easier to forgive, but I believe it went on for years, and it's hard to accept now that everything is out in the open. I have my pride, and I should be able to keep my cool. If there's anything I can do, let me know, I told her as I left and headed back to my parents' house. It's been six months since I initiated divorce proceedings. This morning, I received a copy of the divorce agreement with Anita. I never spoke to her or saw her after she came to my parents' house. My attorney got everything straightened out. I gave her the mortgaged house with expensive furniture and furnishings to clear my name. I also took my name off the mortgage. She took full responsibility for the payments. Of course, with no job, she had to put the house up for sale and lost her money on that deal. She tried to contest the divorce, but I threatened to change the cause of divorce to adultery and put pictures of her and Sam on the internet if she didn't sign the papers within 48 hours. She signed them within the required time, and so, today, I am a free man. I guess she decided she didn't need me that much. Anyway, she was fired from her job, but she's a smart lawyer and negotiator, so within a month she found another one, not making as much money and not having the benefits that seniority brought her at her old job, but I hear she's doing well and dating again. Best of luck to her friend if she finds him. I wonder if she told him about our divorce and the reasons for it. Maybe I should enlighten him. Marie divorced Sam and set him straight financially. He too found another job after he was laid off, but he is having a hard time paying child support and alimony with his new salary. I now live in Santa Maria, California. It's a quiet place near the coast, halfway between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. This allows me to work in both the southern and northern parts of the state. I moved here about four months ago and rent an apartment in a complex with other singles and young couples, most of whom are trying to save up for a down payment on a house. Housing here is expensive, and it takes a lot of money to buy on the market. I have a steady friend who lives in the same complex. She is divorced like me, but we are comfortable together, and I think we will see how things work out in the future. Since I'm traveling so much, I really need to trust whoever I marry. But I need to make a move before much time passes if we want to start a family. The biological clock keeps ticking.